we once again come before you presenting ourselves, Father, in honoring your great and holy name, recognizing that all authority and power has been granted unto you. And because of that, we who are in you and you in us, we now can yield that same power and authority, Father, to go forth as more than conquerors, to no longer be overcome by this world, to be overcome by the flesh or of the devil, but we can truly be overcomers. For Jesus, you have shown us the way. You have stated that you were the first to overcome, and we will follow in your footsteps, O God. And to that end, we will yield and surrender our ourselves. We will allow your word to become preeminent in our lives, that your will would be done through us, Lord, that we can live higher and greater than just earthly existence as we devoid ourselves of the flesh and allow your spirit to become first in our lives. And Lord, as we look towards a new year, we ask Lord God, that your spirit would be more upon this church. Lord, that your glory would show up even more powerful than we've ever seen before. Lord God, we pray for a latter day reign upon each and every one of us here. Lord God, that we would see more come to the saving knowledge of who you are. We would see more being healed. We would see more, Father, of your glorious spirit moving and operating in us. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you open, put your fingers in Revelation chapter 3, we're going to talk about being an overcomer versus being overcome. What does the word overcomer mean? It means to conquer or to gain victory over something. And for the Christian life, it is to gain victory over hostile powers. It is to conquer those things that would bring you down in the book of revelation it's used 15 times so do you think being an overcomer is important to god yes. absolutely You're so an to thank you you're absolutely right so as we go to book of revelation chapter 3 verse 21 says this to him who overcomes i will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now we are part of these churches. Hopefully we are the church of Philadelphia, not the church of Laodicea, right? We know corporately that there's a lot of Laodicean church, a lot of them who say they have need of nothing, that they are rich, they have everything that they need for life and godliness. But God says, in, according to my accounting, you're blind, you're wretched, and you're naked because you've put these things on through your own power, through your own authority, not through putting Christ on. So we're going to talk about the difference. This is one of the last in our series of sanctification. As we've talked about before, justification is easy. It's the finished work of Christ, but he commands us to be sanctified. So I have a question. Is to overcome simply to believe? What do you think? No, pretty resounding no. To overcome is not simply believing. But there are many, we won't mention the churches by name, but there's many of this Laodicean latter-day fence-sitting, lukewarm church that thinks, I believe, therefore I'm an overcomer. Really. Because Christ did more than just believe, didn't he? Because he had works. He did. He went forth. And I want you to think about this. There's a lot of religious people who have pulled themselves out of the world. And, I, and what came to mind, I was thinking of monks. And the idea that I would be more holy or we could become more sanctified if we simply withdraw from society. We withdraw from the world. Do we see Christ ever doing that for any length of time? We see temporary that Christ did withdraw to a solitary place so that he could be refreshed so that he could be recharged and if you're going full strength there's going to have to be a time for repair recharging restrengthening refueling 
You know, we know that in the human body, but in the spiritual body needs that as well. And so, obviously, God says that we're in the world, but we're not of it. We're not to withdraw from the world because how can we be salt and light? How can we spread the gospel, the good news to those who are perishing if we've withdrawn within our own churches, if we withdraw within our own homes, if we simply hide from those who are not like us? So that can't be what God's talking about. Now let's look at the book of Romans. One of everybody's favorite chapter in Romans is chapter 8. So as we glance really quickly at Romans chapter 8, verse 37, let's see what the Word of God has to say. Romans 8 and verse 37 says the following, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. How? Through Him who loved us. And so how do we overcome and conquer? It's not in our own flesh. It's not in our own power and our own strength, but it is Christ in us. He is the one that when we allow him to reign and rule in our lives, he gives us the power and the authority to overcome. And I want you to think about those two things, the power and the authority to overcome. Before Christ left this earth, he said an interesting phrase. He said, all authority and all power have been given unto me. And it hit me driving here this morning. He used that phrase, and there's a differential between the authority and the power. Now, we know according to John chapter 1, that Christ is the living embodiment of the Word of God. And that Word is truth. And that truth is authority. So Jesus says all authority because He is now the living Word. That's where the authority comes from. Because you can't come against truth. There's a lot of people that are walking in things that they think are true. But unfortunately, on that day they die, they're going to find out that their beliefs were not true. And then power. We're Pentecostals. Where do we get the dunamis power? From the Holy Spirit. And so there's a differential there. But the Spirit always uses the Word and operates within that authority. But that Jesus now was going to be delegating through His Word authority. He is going to give you on loan something that will be temporary until we meet Him again face to face. And He said, Holy Spirit, I have to leave. You don't understand. I have to leave. Because if I don't leave, how am I going to send the comforter? So it's Jesus that has sent us this comforter. It is Christ in us. It is His Holy Spirit active in us that gives us the power to truly be overcomers. Not simply believe. Okay? So let's go to the book of Revelation again, where we were. And let's look how many times we get promises if we'd simply overcome. We've already established that roughly 15 times the word overcomer is used in the book of Revelation. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 7. And let's look at the promises that were given unto us who overcome. Verse 7, chapter 2. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That means listen up. To him or her who overcomes... I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Does anybody want to eat from the tree of life? Yeah, yeah. Amen. Absolutely. That's one promise. Let's go to 2 verse 11. There's another promise. He who has an ear. Hmm. I see a pattern here. Let him hear what the Spirit, what the Holy Ghost says to the churches. And we are part of the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. What's the first death? It's a fleshly death, isn't it? Just as it's destined for men to die once and then face judgment. We know this. But there's a second death, and that death is not physical. It's spiritual. Thank you. Do you hear what the promise is? We won't be touched. We will not be hurt by this second death. Why? Because we have overcome. Now let's look at verse 17. There's yet another promise. He's not done with his promises. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who, here's that word again, overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. 
Man has always been about God's provision. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. A white stone is a good thing. I don't want a black stone that says I'm guilty. I don't want a black stone that says I have been somehow excluded from the blessing. But if we have a white stone with a new name on it that only Christ knows, we have an entry. We have a ticket. Okay? And the hidden manna. Who wouldn't want hidden manna? Something that has been stored up. That provision. Are you out praying right now that God releases provision into your life? Because we can't do it on our own provisions. We can't do it through what we store up in the physical. We need supernatural provision. And remember, manna was supernatural. Manna is what God provides. We all need it. And he's given us that promise. I'm excited about these promises. I don't know about you. Verse 26 in chapter 2. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end. Up, oh, there's a little caveat there, doesn't it? My will... I will give authority over the nations. Now, this is a very, very important promise. And this goes through what I have been saying for several months now. If we give up our own will, if we have more oil that's purchased in the Garden of Gethsemane, where we have that wrestling match, where we, there is suffering, there will be suffering as a Christian. If you're not suffering, then you're not really living a Christian life. But in that garden experience where we are again tested, we are again tempted, we are then given the option, given the opportunity, given the choice to live for self or to live for him. It is there that we purchase this oil, this precious oil. And he says, if you do my will to the end, that's above and beyond anything that we can get through our own hands, through our own works. He says, I will give you, remember I've been talking about this, I will give you power to rule. I will give you authority over nations. Now that may not sound like anything because you're like, I don't want authority over anything. But we're talking about once the flesh is gone. Remember I told you, justification, sanctification, glorification. Glorification is a release from the presence of sin. When you're glorified and you have authority over the nations, there will be no more presence of sin in you. So you'll be able to think differently. You'll be more focused, more clear than you've ever been before. We're tainted by the old man and the old woman. It, through every breath, through every thought, even in our dreams, we're haunted. That old man, that old woman wants to rise up inside of you. It wants to say, you know what, I'm going to do this on my own. And we even have people in the church saying this. And I heard this since I was a boy. And I never... Never felt comfortable with it until I became a Christian. And I realized it's bogus. God helps them who yeah. helps themselves. What? Right, because if you think about it, that's not scriptural. It's not what Christ says. If he says, you yield, you surrender, you die. Matter of fact, Paul talks about, so death is in us so that life can reign in us. What's he talking about? The death is of the old man so that the new life in Christ can reign and rule. And if we allow his life to reign and rule in us and his will to be done, then we will have authority over nations. I don't know about you, not that I have any desire to rule, but I can't think in that perfected state quite yet. But I can already get a glimpse, but I can trust him who says you'll be able to handle authority. Because if you can handle it here on earth, you'll be able to handle it there. And so are we not in a training ground right now? Are we not in a proving field? That's what we are right now. So that's why this life is not easy. Because he's trying to weed out those who are not sincere. Those who are truly not the overcomer. So let's go to chapter 3 now. And let's look at verse 5. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. I don't know about you, but that's enough to shout about. That is an exciting thing. That we will never be lost, and we will be able to be clothed in his righteousness and his whiteness. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus who has done this for us. And again in verse 12. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. 
Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. That's incredibly powerful right there. Now, what does a pillar do if we're going to be pillars in the temple of God? If you go to a pillar of a large edifice, it's that which supports. It's part of the structure. It's Without the pillars, everything would cave in. That means we're given responsibility. Okay? I know, remember we've, we've already talked about the parable of the talents. Interestingly, every one of the servants were giving something, weren't they? Every one of them had some measure of responsibility. It's what you do with that responsibility that God is looking at. The one that had five doubled what he had. He took his responsibility seriously and he did something. The one who had two doubled also. He wasn't given as much, but he didn't whine. Well, why don't you give me five? No. You gave me two, it was okay, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to do what you've taught me to do, what you've trained me to do, what you've shown me to do, and I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to be obedient. Now, don't you think about those terms. Those are vastly important in the Christian walk. Faithfulness and obedience. And then the last one, he got one. And he kind of copped a little bit of attitude. And I'm sure in the back of his mind, he's thinking, well, you like that one more than me because he got five. And that one over there, he got two. And all I got is one. You know, you're harsh taskmaster. I'm just going to bury it. You may not like responsibility, but you know what? If you grow up and you become mature, isn't it natural that you get given more responsibility? Mm -hmm. God's not looking for babies. Babies, while they may be cute and we get pictures with Denise with their babies and all that, they take a lot of work, don't they? I mean, they, they don't clean themselves. They don't feed themselves. They can't go out and take care of business and get a job themselves. So God certainly doesn't want us to stay as little bitty infants, as babies. And some of us have been infantile in our walks. And the true Christian walk is to move from this state of requiring milk to being weaned. And once you're weaned, to learn how to become more mature so you can accept more responsibility, more authority, so that you can be more useful in his hands. Doesn't our loving, gracious, heavenly father want to pour more into you? Didn't he just say, I've got hidden manna? I've got white stones. I've got responsibility. I've got authority that I'm trying to give to you. But you just need to grow up a little bit more. How much responsibility can you give to a 10-year-old? In the state of Alabama, are they legally able to stay by themselves? No. 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 When they're 18, you may not want them to stay by themselves, but they're legal to stay by themselves, right? God doesn't want us to stay adolescents either. Because with adolescence, even though you may give them more responsibility, in the back of your mind, you still have some concerns, don't you? Are they going to do things that are not honoring to my household, honoring to, to my reputation? Are they going to somehow taint or tarnish the family name? Think about that. Because they're still a little bit young. Because there's still a lot of kick in their hips. They're, they're still wanting to kick against the goads and rebel and, and pull against the reins. You know, a horse that's been mature and has pulled a cart, you don't have to give it a lot of instructions. It knows what's required of it. But that young one who's only green broken, oh, there's still a lot of fight in that horse. He still wants his own will, doesn't he? I don't know if you ever had a horse try to bite you or kick you, but it is not a pleasant experience. And if you have one that learns that it can exert its will on you, you'll find even though you're wanting to go to the distal portion of the pasture, it wants to return back to the barn. And you're constantly fighting it and spurring it to trying to get it to where you want it to go. God is tired of having to ride his people like that and having to spur us and having to whack us with the reins or a riding crop to get us to do what he wants us to do. Because eventually you say, look, if you don't want this, if you want to continue to kick against the goads, I'm no longer going to give you power and authority. I'm going to withdraw from you. Okay? We don't want to be there, church. 
we just don't want to be there. But these promises are for those who overcome. And lastly, we covered 321. We'll cover it again because it is important. To him who overcomes, I will give the right. I will give the right to think about that. Think about that. He will give the right to sit with him on his throne. Wow. Just as Christ overcame and sat down with his father and sat down in his throne, we will have those rights. We think we have those rights, but that's not what the Bible says. It says, if you overcome. Remember last week we talked about the narrow gates. There's two gates. The first narrow gate is just the entrance into the kingdom. But there's a second narrow gate that many will try to go through and will not be able to go through. Because it has to do with your sanctification. It has to do with you taking, taking what Christ has given you and, and obeying it and living for him and growing up and maturing. Yes, Mary. How can we all sit there? Are you going to take turns? <laughs> <laughs> we have more than one throne. You, you, have, you have a right to sit on the throne. And what you need to understand, that right means you have a right to rule. That you have a right to wield authority. Not that you would necessarily literally no. be sitting down on the throne. But figuratively, figuratively, you will have authority, Mary. You will have responsibility. Right now, what has God put you responsible of? You have a home, don't you? Mm -hmm. So you have responsibilities over that home. You have a bank account. You have monies. So you have responsibility over that. We're stewards of things. Some people have more. Teased, you teased uh, Becky yesterday. Or you teased. <laughs> you got teased yesterday a little bit by Mary. And it was, you said, uh, Mary said, uh, you're loaded. And I know she was kidding. Oh. We were just, she, was, she was just kidding, Brenda. We know that. But the reality is some people have been given the godly ability to produce wealth. And what they do with their wealth they're responsible for. They're stewards over. Now, you're not responsible for somebody else's wealth, are you, Miss Brenda? I'm not responsible for any wealth that Anne has. She's responsible before God for her own. And so I don't need to whine about what Anne is doing or what she should do. That's none of my business between her and God. Now, if she comes to me and she asks as a leader, then I have a right to speak into her. But what this is saying, Mary, is right now you're responsible for this much. It may be one talent. It may be two talents. It may be five talents. But irrespective of how much, you still are a steward of that. You are responsible for it. Yeah. And you're going to have to answer some questions about it, just like I'm going to have to. Okay? But if we are doing things in His will, if we were doing things in His power, if we were doing things through His authority... And allowing self to die, then we will overcome. And we're not going to have to shrink back on that day at the Bama seat. Okay? Overcoming is the key to inheriting the kingdom and reign. Now, 1 John, let's go to 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter five, verse four says the following for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Now, some people will use this and twist it and say, see, all I got to do is have faith and I will overcome. Yeah, you will overcome the world, but you are not the overcomer that we've just been talking about. Those that are going to be reigning and ruling with Christ. It's not just as we stated before. It's not just a belief. It's doing something with that belief. And I'm going to give you several other scriptures to prove that. But we are born of God. And if we're truly born of God and we're sons of God, then we're going to submit ourselves. Because didn't Jesus show that? The only begotten. What did he do? He didn't go out and kick against the goads. Jesus gave us an example of humility and obedience. Though he had the power to come off the cross, though he had the power to overcome his accusers, though he had the power to silence every tongue and mouth that spoke against him, he chose not to. He shut his mouth and he humbled himself, even though he found himself in the form of a man, and he walked it out. He worked it out, doing only what he heard the Spirit speak to him, doing what he saw his Father doing. 
That is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. So an experiential understanding, a positional understanding are two different things. Your position and your experiences. Positionally, we are careers with Christ in the heavenlies, are we not? He's already established that. Now we have to go forth in experiential knowledge. Because if you promote somebody simply with a positional knowledge, they may have no idea. If you just say, take a new recruit who is an E3 and you move them up to a four-star general, he's not going to have a clue how to, how to do that kind of leadership because he has no experiential knowledge. And so, again, like those monks I talked about, they lock themselves out. They're not interacting with the world. And there's certain churches that close their doors to the outside world. That is not us. That is not what we're called to do. We are called through positional knowledge now to go forth with an experiential understanding. That means we have to work it out. We have to get out there and get our feet wet, our hands dirty. When Mary and Martha had their thing, Mary, Martha was over there doing all these other things in her own power. And Mary was just sitting at the feet learning from the master. That's where we need to be. And once we learn from the master, are we not supposed to engage in that? A transmission in neutral won't get you very far. We've got to put it in drive. Right? Now, I want you to think of it this way. If you come home from a busy day of, of work, whatever you've been doing, you've been very active all day, you come home, you kick off your shoes, you sit on the sofa, and you grab the TV remote, and you turn power, you hit it, nothing happens. You hit it again, nothing happens. So you get a little bit closer and you, you, you start pressing that little red button trying to get the TV to turn on and it's still not turning on. Now, if you're a man, that's when you go to the back and you pull off the back and you knock the batteries out and you twist them and you turn them and you put them back in and then you whack it. And you hit it a few more times and still the TV is not turning on. Y'all have been there, haven't you? Okay. And finally, you get up off your duff. And you go to the TV and you try the manual on switch. Nothing happens. Then you shake the TV a little bit. Tap it. Do the fonz. And it still doesn't turn on. What probably is the issue? No power. No, say it louder. No power. No power. There's no power. And so you go back and you realize inadvertently it's been unplugged. You've been unplugged. You got to plug back in to receive the power to be able to do anything. And so many of us have set back on our own laurels. We've set back on what we've done in the past. We've really been unplugged, whether knowingly or unknowingly. And we think, even though we're now sitting on a sofa and we're kicked back and we're relaxing, that we're going to yield the same authority, the same power that we've had before, that same walk that we were part of before. But you don't understand, you've been unplugged from the source. We've got to return to that source as Christ demonstrated when he withdrew to a solitary place regularly, frequently, to reconnect, to recharge. Remember, I use those terms to get plugged back into the source so he can continue to pour out. So you can't keep pouring out on your own. Sure, if all you did was pour out on your own power, what are you going to get really quickly? Worn out and burned out, all right? Burned out and worn out. We're trying to do things in our own power. And they may be good, and they may be moral, and they may help somebody, but when we're doing them on our own power, they don't have eternal rewards. It's not storing up gifts and, and, and rewards for you in heaven. Those are things done in your own power. You're seeking your own rewards here on earth. But if we're doing things by yielding ourselves, remember, it's not God's helping those who help themselves. Those who pour themselves out and say, God, I recognizing that without you, nothing I do is important. Not really of eternal significance. But through you, through you, all things are possible because I believe and I have faith. And I know you'll put in me exactly what's needed and what's necessary to bring this about to its proper end. To bring this about to where there's going to be true blessing. Where there's going to be people really touched and ministered to and so the idea here is not about you picking up and doing something as much as saying god i am pouring myself out to listen to your voice and i will seek your face so as you speak into me and when your spirit moves i will move 
Now, this is not a completely relaxed. Sometimes I, I've got an argument for a man in the Philippines about God's not holding anything back. Y'all just need to seize it. Just go get it. I like to hear God because I can get very caught up in doing things on my own power and my own accord. I've got to hear from God. But in order to hear from God, we can't just sit on the sofa unplugged, do we? We've got to get back in his word because he'll speak to you through his word. We've got to get back in a regular prayer. We've thrown this word out intentional. We have to be intentional. Alicia said this morning, a lot of us don't have a game plan. Not really. We may say we do, but it's somewhere taking a back seat. It's probably back on a shelf somewhere in our lives and is gathering dust. Do we really have a game plan to see his kingdom established in our lives? Do we really use some battle strategy to be an overcomer this day? Oh, I know you're charged up for church on Sundays and some of y'all on Wednesdays. But do we every day of the week get up and say, God, whatever your will is, I want to be part of it. Please arrange those divine appointments. I don't want to miss a one, God. I don't want to miss a single thing about what you're doing. And Father, I'm right now asking in the name of Jesus that you provide the power and the authority to overcome myself, to overcome this world, and to overcome the devil this day. God, for my portion is for right now in this moment. I'm not worried about yesterday because yesterday's gone. There's nothing I can do about it. You know what happened 10 years? I can't do anything about it. My fear is going to be met by faith. And when faith starts operationing, fear has to leave. But we have got to get back where we're plugged back in to the source of all of power. What is God's will? First Thess Thessalonians chapter 4. Yes, I went to speech therapy as a child. First Thessalonians. Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3 says the following. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. So if anybody was in any doubt, there it is. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. And as a part of that, avoiding sexual immorality. That you would learn to control your own body. In a way that is holy and honorable. Don't be like the heathen. We are called to be a sanctified body. The authority that comes from Christ comes from the living word. The power comes from the Holy Ghost. And we need to learn to make faith choices not emotional ones we're an emotional people we're an emotional church i mean we're pentecostals okay sometimes our emotions get the best of it and there's nothing wrong with honoring god with your emotions but that's just one part of you those things that really work the will of god are those faith choices not emotional reactions now some of us are more emotional than the others. I, I have a lot of emotional reactions. Things come out before I even think. Not only Alicia, but Denise cringes sometimes, not knowing what I'm going to say. <laughs> but, but when God is in it and we are surrendered, then those faith choices can come to the surface and not merely our emotions. It's not that you can't serve God with your emotions, but what is a more excellent way? That even though your emotions say, I'm going to get back at this individual, the power of God says you need to love, you need to forgive, you need to pray for. Amen? So let's think about this. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Just right here in God's word. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away. But the man who does the will of God does what? He lives forever. A lot of us are still have a lot of the love of the world in us. 
I'm still working that out in me. It's a daily process to tell the sinful man no and to sell the soulful spiritual man yes. And the Bible is very clear. If you have this love of the world, then the love of the Father is really not active in us. These things are temporary. Wouldn't we rather be caught up with the things that are eternal? So let's think about those things. The lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. Let's talk about the lust of the flesh. It's not just a sexual thing. In Alabama and Mississippi, we're well known for being number one and number two in obesity. There's lust of gluttony. There's love for food that surpasses other things. I'm not trying to pick on that, but let's think about these things. Love of alcohol, love of pills, just trying to escape, love of video games, things that cause you to escape this world, the, the difficulties of the, of, the, of the world, and simply taking on another part of the world that you just love, okay? And you're getting very unbalanced. And we tend to do that. We, we humans tend to get something that brings pleasure to us and we keep tapping it, tapping it, tapping it, tapping it. Whether it be pills, whether it be sex, whether it be alcohol, whether it be TV, these things that we pleasure ourselves with. But it's all encompassed with lust of the flesh. Now let's talk about lust of the eyes. We could look at Donald Trump and he has a life that's lavish. Matter of fact, he talks about I can't be bribed because I'm full of money. I got enough money. Can't control me with money. It's the material things. And I want you to think about several well-known pastors who have a lot of money. Oh, but, but, but I can better minister to the world if I have this $4.3 million airplane. Seriously? I got a guy, if you give him a thousand bucks, can see 250 people saved. And you want to talk about having a special airplane, which is completely unnecessary. But it's, it's, it's the lust of the eyes, and that is these material things. There's nothing wrong with driving a nice car, but it's all in balance. It's all a life in perspective to what Christ has given you. Could we all give more? Yes. Could we all do more? Yes. So I'm not trying to beat us over the head, but what I'm saying is when the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes becomes more important than your worship of God, we're completely out of balance and the love of the Father is not in us. Now, the last one is the pride of life. And this is the one I see the Donald Trumpisms very much like this. He's braggadocious. He's arrogant. I don't need anybody else. And you know what? He, oh, he throws out to the Christians that he loves God. No, he doesn't. God is an addition to his life. It's not a submission. Because he wants to brag in the next breath about his money. He wants to brag in the next breath how he's gotten to where he is. Well, you know, Donald Trump filed bankruptcy. He had to be bailed out by his creditors. So he has been bolstered and lifted up by many a person to be where he is today. Has he really bowed his knee to Jesus Christ? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. There's too much boastful pride. There's too much arrogance. And God does not work through those things. But this is the pride of life. And Christian pride can enter all of our lives where we think we're better than this church or we personally are better than that. Well, I'm not like that person next to me. And God, God knows the very intents of our hearts. He knows our thoughts. And so these things are repulsive to him. You say, well, I don't really have these things. Well, some of us struggle with insecurities. Some of us struggle with self-esteem, self-worth. These things are not good. I don't need any self-esteem. I need God esteem because he says I'm worthy then we're worthy. Because he says, I'm loved, then I'm loved. So why do we need more self? Anything that starts with self is what the devil's trying to shove down our throats. That that's what we need. Because some psychologist or psychiatrist said it. Let me tell you what. Let me be very clear on this. That is a lie from the pit of hell. You don't need more self. Self-actualization, self-realization. We need self-denial is what we need. So that self dies at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ and we become more Christ-centered, we become more God-filled so we can pick up the authority and the power of Jesus Christ. And we can wield it in this dying world that's so caught up with pop psychology that they don't know the truth if they were to whack them over the head. They're full of attitude, they're full of insulting, they're full of mocking ways. But a true Christian is going to pour himself out because we recognize we're not important. But Christ in us is everything. Y'all understand where I'm coming from? Okay. That's good preaching right there. And it's true. I, I'm so, coming from the medical world, I'm so sick of self this, self that, self-esteem. You don't need more self-esteem. My self-esteem 
comes through Jesus Christ, what he speaks to me, what he says in his word that we are, which we just read. All those promises, if we're overcomers, we don't overcome through our own strength. We overcome through our own death. So it's death that is operational in me so that life can be more operational in me. Death to self, life to Christ. That is the Christian walk. Are we going to suffer? We've already been promised that we're going to suffer. If we're not suffering, we're not really serving Christ. So next time I speak, I'm going to give you a little taste of in the objects of the temple, you had a laver. And in this bronze laver was water. And the priest first walked in and they went to these bronze lavers and they cleansed their feet and their hands. After they did that, where'd they go, Keith? The brazen altar. And they offered up sacrifice. After they did the brazen altar, they had blood on them. Where did they go after that? The molten sea. Now, they weren't allowed in the Holy of Holies. They had blood on them. They, they were unclean at this point. Well, let me go ahead and explain. I have time? Yeah, i just use this. Number one, it's called the priestly way to God or the priestly way to sanctification. Number one, when the priest first came in, there were these basins, these bronze lavers of water, and they were polished to a mirror finish. Why? When the priest bent over to wash his hands and feet, guess what he was seeing? himself a reflection of his own humanity a reflection of all those self things that needed to die and that was the first step of recognizing god i am impure in myself god i need you it was a place of repentance because the priest couldn't just walk in the holy of holies there had to be a place of repentance. There had to be a place of confession. There had to be a place where you were responsible and you owned your own sinfulness. We have to own up. You're right, God. I'm wrong. You're right. God, I did wrong. I've fallen short. You are righteous. That was these bronze lavers. And once they went through that confessional, that taking responsibility and saying, Oh, God. I confess my sins before you. Then the next step was going to the brazen altar where you brought your sacrifice. And there, when you offered your sacrifice, you are making an atonement for your sins. Now, back then, it only lasted a year. Now we have the blood of Jesus upon us. And it's these things that symbolize are letting the blood atone for our sinful self. Now, once you got done with that sacrifice, you had the blood from the sacrifice upon you. Blood of a lamb. Okay? So the next step the priest had to do is go into this large sea of bronze, which water contained in this huge tub. I mean, it fit, it would fit over a hundred bathtubs in it. And they went in and bathed wholly, completely. And as they were doing this, this is the washing of the water. And for the modern Christian, where do we get washed in the water? Word. It's in the word of God. Because we had to confess, we had to make an atonement, we have to be washed in his word before we can enter the presence of God. And lastly, the priest was then able to walk into the Holy of Holies. Once he's been purified, once he's been cleansed. And you say, yeah, well, Christ did it. You're correct. But you still have to own your sins. You still have to confess He's faithful and just, but we have to confess our sins. Then there has, to be an, there has to be a blood offering, a blood atoning. And it's in Jesus to say, yes, Jesus, I receive that blood atoning. And God, I'm going to be cleansed now through the washing of your word. Lord God, that every day I'm going to go to your word and I'm going to get washed for this day so that I can get back into reconciliation with you. I'm going to get back in a right relationship. I'm going to get back in fellowship with God. We need to be plugged back in in that manner. God had those objects in his temple for a reason. They're not gone forever. They just simply change to a more spiritual thing. Okay, But the same purposes are there for us. That The same stages we have to go through. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can be washed daily in this word. Lord God, that we can now walk in the authority and the power because we have the word of God on our side and we have the spirit within us. And Lord God, we don't have to succumb to this world. We can truly be overcomers. Lord God, we don't have to be consumed by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, but we can overcome through your word, O oh God, and through your power of laying down our own lives to allow you to become preeminent first in all things. God, before we lift our hands, we will give you our heart first. Oh God, we need more of you. We confess we need less of ourselves and more of your Holy Ghost inside of us, guiding us, leading us, being a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. God, for without you, you were like blind men stumbling. We can truly accomplish nothing. But through you, Jesus, all things are possible to them that believe and receive and walk according, not according to the counsel of men, but according to the counsel of your word. God, it's in your holy name I pray. And as we look to this new New year god let us push off that which is old let us let us remove these dirty garments father god let's get plugged back in to your word let's get plugged back in to our power source lord that we can be trained and grow up to be mature christians able to handle the responsibility that you're wanting to give us to him who overcomes we know you've promised that you will give and god to that end we want to glorify your great and holy name amen